George Barry and I coordinate Farming for Nature. Farming for Nature was set up to advise and support farmers that farm or wish to farm more for nature. And one of the ways we do this is each year we find exemplary farmers who are doing as much as they can for nature on their land whilst being productive farmers. So these are our Farming for Nature ambassadors and this Q&A is a great way to hear from these ambassadors. So throughout the series, um, I in, in, each month I interview a different ambassador. So tonight I'll kickstart the event by asking a few questions. And then if any of you have any questions, please put them in your chat box and I'll facilitate them later um, as much as we can. If you missed any of our previous sessions, they're all up on our YouTube channel. Or if you miss any of tonight or you know of anyone that would like to see tonight's session, it will also be up on our U YouTube channel by uh, tomorrow. So um, on to tonight's uh, event. We are delighted to have uh, welcome one of our more, or two of our more recent awarded ambassadors. Uh, Justina and Liam Gavin have joined us from County Roscommon. Hi guys. The Gavins Hi. run a mixed run a mixed up farm in County Roscommon, but they also run Ireland's first, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, organic drive-through in Carrigan Shannon, and they have a restaurant to add to their repertoire up in Salt uh, Strandhill in Sligo. So Justina and Liam, welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Liam, we might just start with you. Um, as I men mentioned, you you manage a mixed stock farm and horticultural farm. Um, can you just describe your own journey onto this farm? Yeah, so um, where we are now, um, we're on the home farm, which I would have inherited from my uncle. And that would have been around 40 acres. And we gradually extended that to approximately 150 acres over the last uh, 10 or 12 years. And um, and then we we acquired an, another farm, more of a farmy farm in uh, Roscommon, near Roscommon town, Four Mile House. And that's um, more like a beef, a beef farm. And um, on the farm here, we, we have... Um, Mostly suckler cows here because the land is a heavy clay soil. So I keep most of the cows here and um, we have laying hens. Um, we have about 200 laying hens that we rotate around the farm. And um, we have market garden then as well, which about 900 square meters of, of tunnels and then about a half acre of outdoor growing space for salads for the restaurants um, and the little farm shops that are attached to the restaurants. Um, we have a small number of sheep, but we tend to, um, if we need lamb, we will deal with local organic farmers um, for that. Um, we're looking into some agroforestry at the moment. Um, so I have uh, contacted a, a, a couple of people and consultants. And so we're looking to see, get an assessment of the land to see what might work for us in this particular kind of environment here. Um, on the other farm, um, as I said, it's mostly beef, finishing beef, and we we do have about ten acres of um, organic oats, and we which we use ourselves, and we have around um, so I think this year we'll have around seventeen acres of red clover silage, um, and we're going to try ten acres of the mixed sort of species. Uh, grass um that might go in where they where they where the uh, uh oats were so um so that's kind of mo I'm mostly on the kind of production side and I also operate a uh, we have a bakery primarily an organic bakery so we have a lot of products that are um certified organic and I would supply Justina's restaurants um with the it's very hard to deal with <laughs> with with the bakery products and with the products from the farm and um so kind of that's that that's my side of it and we also have a production kitchen as well and that supplies the that supplies the restaurants with other things like the sauces and the chips and things like that to support the restaurants so um yeah that's that's kind of that keeps us that keeps us busy wow oh. There's a there's quite a lot there, and I'm not too sure why you didn't just stop at like like hens or something. But it's amazing <laughs> how way. you have rippled out. I, I'm sure there's there's always new ideas brewing, which is great. But just you know, obviously, to take us to all the seasons would take us nearly too long. But it's springtime now, so can you give us an idea of what's kind of happening on your farm now with your livestock, with your animals? 
how many do you have people working for you do you have woofers on your land what what does it look like what's on yeah. your farm at the moment so we have i have a, a part-time um sort of livestock guy who comes in for a couple of hours each evening and he takes care of the the bedding and um the feeding if there's anything to be done and organizes the the cattle and if there's anything to do with the sheep um on the on the polytunnel side we have someone who's employed more or less full time and um, so she will be joined by somebody, at least one person next week and then a second person and to just, just when the growing season kicks off. So the tunnels now are that sort of it's all kind of happening out there. So the plan is there and it's just get, we need a bit more help to get that organized Um, on. Yeah, the, the, the calving is I, I have a late calving. So because we supply ourselves, um, we can we can be, you know, we can plan our, our own calving. So I do a really tight calving, sort of four to five weeks maximum if I can. And that started about, uh, you know, a week ago. But I, I only have about 20 calvings this year. And on the other farm, just purely for acres scheme, we will have about 12 or 14 calvings over there. So um, I, I, I have the cows up near the house when they're calving and I have them on camera. So we kind of keep an eye on things there. So, um, yeah, we're pretty vigilant on that side of things. You have a good maternity ward on site. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, the, with the, the feed that you're producing, you were talking about your kind of your red clover silage and then the oats. Are the oats, sorry, for your bakery or are they for feed? Or yeah, so how do you feed your animals or do you... Are you reliant on the outside feed coming in? So, yeah, no, we don't buy in any feed other than the organic layer pellets for the hens. Um, so we find that that well, they kind of need that that kind of ration that has the that has everything they need to, to keep them laying. That's really important. Um, but we do supplement um their their those rations with our own organic oats. So every day we make sure that they have they have a you know maybe. 20% of what they get in feed is made up of our own organic oats. And, um, and they're also out on grass, obviously, as well. So they're, 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 they're... they're actually properly free range. Um, yeah. yeah. So they, they the, the tunnel moves around and then the, the, the hens are always out unless it's raining. So mm -hmm. um, so that works. That works quite well. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the kind of the, the, the feed. We do feed the um, the cows. We just give them a little bit of. Uh, organic oats we try and feed the cows hay that's the my preference um nothing scientific about it so i much rather keep the cows clean and um so they're all dry bedded they're all deep bedded in straw um there's no we don't have slats and i find that the hay keeps them really clean really warm and um so we top them up a little bit we just give them a little bit of oats uh just throughout the winter and as they're coming up to calving and we find that works really well so that is one of the stipulations that we're, I can't remember if Liam mentioned it, but we're both farms are certified organic with the organic trust. And mm. one of the kind of re organic regulations around animal welfare is, is that thing around housing, the amount of space the animals have, but also that they have these dry laybacks um, in, in the sheds rather than kind of being on, on slats. There's, what, what percentage of slats? 50, the, the kind of the organic standard is 50%, but ours is, ours is 100%. So we just designed all our housing they're all timber framed housing uh, they're all dry bedded and um, they have designed so that there's a deep bed at the back and um, we have fiber cement sheeting on the roofs so we don't have any condensation and um, we have never had any incidents of pneumonia in our in our on our home farm here. Interesting and you're obviously not using any antibiotics preventatives or anything because of your organic system. I'll just um, on that one, um, yeah, just, just to clear that up, because it, I think it is a question that a lot of people have, that if you are organic, it, it doesn't mean that you can't treat your animals. It just means that you treat them according to what's actually required by mm -hmm. either the vet or if it's part of your animal health plan. So for sheep, for example, you might say that you have a have a routine dose dosing pattern for uh, for fluke, for example. So you're not prevented from treating your animals, but it is very, it's, 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 it's recorded and your withdrawal periods are observed and it's twice the withdrawal period um, or three times, depending on the amount of time for, um, for organic standards. Interesting. Yeah. 
And tell me, obviously, at the moment, it's a huge challenge for farmers in terms of the weather. How do you feel on your farm that you've kind of adapted to or mitigated for, I mean, current situation, the weather now, and then in general, if there's, you know, changes to the weather patterns? Well, I, I suppose that's, I did, the, I mentioned the agroforestry um, side of things. So um, now we've only been on, the, like my, my family have had this farm for a long time, but we've been farming it for about 12 years and yeah, I suppose it's hard to say, oh, you know, it's a massive difference, but I feel it and I know it's happening and it's kind of obvious every, every, every month a new record is set and it's, it's all, it's all very gloomy, that side of things, but we can, we, all we can do is what we can do ourselves. And so that's why I'm looking into the agroforestry. So if there's areas say on the farm that I kind of think that are a little bit wet or a bit heavier, then maybe that's an ideal place to plant um, so we're looking at the native uh, native trees for that and not the kind of coniferous trees, but the sort of more more like kind of the oak, oak type trees or broad leaves or um, alder, that type of thing. So we're we're looking into that. And I think that hopefully will, you know, it, it's, it'll be something anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so pretty much that's and the calving pattern. I've pushed it out later and later and. Um, you know, and the same with the sheep. So I don't have very straight sheep, but we're trying to make sure that the weather is good. So when I'm calving now, my 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 calves will go out the same day, or if it's really bad weather, they'll go out the next day. So there's no kind of calves hanging around sheds or anything like that. So um, I suppose that's that's what we do. So the breed itself. So we're doing Dexters. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a herd of pedigree Dexters, and they're small animals. They're gentle on the land. Um, and part of that choice, Aegis could be really like the breed and wanted to be promoting a native Irish breed, but also because they are gentle on the land and this land, especially here on the home farm, it is naturally wet anyway, even without what's happening at the moment. It's slopey, it's 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 very rough ground, but they are, um, they're actually, they're, they're great in this kind of environment, you know, they're well adapted to it and they're, they're lightweight as well, so they're very gentle. The, 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 Brilliant. And you, you're you on the edge of a lake, Lock Key, um, but you also have a lot of different habitats on your land. You might Can you take us through some of the habitats or, and some of the actions that you've specifically done for nature on your land? Yeah, so I suppose we, we, are, we are exactly, we are on the lake, we border the lake, so we have um, hundreds of metres of lake shore. So years ago, we actually, we, we put um, a, bit, a boundary between ourselves and the lake uh, and, and the water. And that might be 30 or 40, 30 meters, you know, to, to 15 meters. And so the, the cattle don't have access to the lake. Um, and we 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 have designed it in such a way that that along the shore that that we've got a wildlife corridor, if you like, or that's the corridor that the wildlife use anyway. And so we're overrun with um with fallow deer here at the moment, for example. So they kind of happily Kind of well, we, they're always they're always in the fields as well, but they they're able to kind of um, meander down along the lake and go from place to place along our mm -hmm. farm. Um, so you know we we it's a, a lot of is on this farm is not what we've done, but what we haven't done. So we haven't done we haven't disturbed any of the the hedgerows, for example. We've got very old hedgerows here, so we preserved all of those. We have ring forts which we pres preserved and fenced them off. Um, We've we pl we've actually planted quite a few um I suppose native um hedges where we thought they were kind of missing, and um so we've we've introduced a good few plants on that side of things, um so that that that's kind of that's kind of what we do on that side of it. Is there anything I'm missing? Um no, just that, that, so we have very old pasture here. Like we think Liam's family have been farming here going back I think nearly to the 1600s. Um, wow. so you know Liam has kind of preserved those old pastures as well so there would be naturally occurring kind of um, multi-species swords yeah. here in, in fields yeah we're kind of reluctant to do kind of big you know the whole Chagas receding programs that like a lot of people have done over the last kind of 20 years so um, when the hens have been on the land then we would kind of try to to try to put in clover or some of some of the other grasses just to kind of boost it up and refresh it um, and there's a lot of native tree cover here already, as Lynn says, that we've 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 preserved. So we've got a, a really lovely kind of ancient woodlands just abutting the lake here that I'm looking at out the window here. And that would be all um, you know, broadleaf trees, na na native um trees. So there's there's an amazing abundance of kind of bird and insect life here, which is lovely to see. Yeah, I can imagine. 
And the, you know, you, you've got a massive diversity within the farm, but then you obviously have massive diversity in, in terms of your food production and then getting to the consumer. Just, you know, you might just take us through when it leaves the farm, how many different directions does it go and what does this look like for you? <laughs> well, I suppose one of the, um, the, the kind of idea behind the project was about producing um, food locally um, and um, selling that direct to our local community. So it was about um, keeping food miles as low as we possibly could. So in relation to the products that are coming from our farm, so all of Liam's beef, all of the salads we grow here, they all are only supplied into our two restaurants. So, so the beef goes from here, the, the cattle go from here in a trailer up to um, a, a small family butcher up in Grange just outside Sligo. So it's about a 45 minute journey. And then um, they they come back in um in in, in the fridge van, <laughs> ready <laughs> ready to supply into the into the restaurants. So um you know but but it's very small. Like Liam sending one sometimes two a week to the to to the abattoir butchery. Um they have a very short journey. It's just them in the in the trailer. They arrive there. It's a very small, very respectful kind of environment. There's not big crowds of animals kind of being pushed off trucks in that kind of factory environment. Mm -hmm. Um. And then they're processed and they come back. Um, and we have a storage facility, um, which is halfway between the two, two restaurants in Castle Baldwin. And we um, and, and the meat is supplied out to Strand Hill and to Carrick. So we have a delivery run a couple, couple of times a week. The salads that we're growing here, again, they all go into the restaurants um, and they're harvested. We're harvesting three times a week. And that's just getting picked up in our delivery van and dropped to either the production kitchen or to the two restaurants. So, so we're on the N4. So our two restaurants our production unit and our bakery and the farm are all kind of spread out along the sort of N4 corridor. So um, it's it's a very short kind of local. I think it's probably about 50 kilometres from Carrick to Strand Hill. So it's all happening within that same kind of 50 kilometre um, uh, radius, um, if you like. But even within, I mean, I've been into one of your restaurants, even within the restaurant, you have a farm shop, you have a restaurant, and you also have a, a drive-through concept, isn't it? So, I mean... You, you don't kind of stop at one concept like how how or why are you branching out into the, all these areas what kind of started so we it's actually the, the restaurant in Carrick and Shannon used to be a KFC so we really like the fact that we've kind of done a bit of a, a, bit of a reinvention of that kind of fast food concept so we're still our menu is still very much kind of fast food orientated so it's it's burgers it's fries but it's burgers with our organic dexter beef our own homemade organic breads our homegrown organic salads um, so it's kind of, I suppose, a reinvention of that and a sort of hopefully a kind of a makeover of that kind of food. And it and it's we're doing food very much with sustainability um, in mind. So, you know, our produce from the farm is going to the restaurants, but we also source it's not enough to, to fully supply the restaurants. So we also support source products and ingredients from other like minded producers that we sell in the farm shop, but also on our menu. So all of the veg that we serve on the menu is organic. That's kind of one of our bottom lines. Um, and obviously there's a very short growing season here in Ireland and there's no way we could produce all of that ourselves. One of the biggest challenges actually has been about kind of trying to balance what we can physically do with our farm and and our yeah, and, and running a restaurant and people's expectations, I suppose. So people, mm -hmm. you know, they want a tomato, a slice of tomato in their burger all year round. Tomatoes grow in Ireland from July to November, if you're lucky. Um, so it's kind of we've over the last 10 years, we've had to kind of constantly be asking ourselves lots of questions about, OK, what can we do here? What can't we do? What's going to work? What's going to be commercially viable and balance that with actually the, the ethos of the business, which is doing things as sustainably and environmentally consciously as possible. So with the veg, it's all organic all year round, but we import out of season from um, uh, an organic uh, veg distributor in the Netherlands who are sourcing their veg from European growers. Um, but also one of the tenants of what we're doing is about this route to market for other people so it's a, the restaurants are a route to market for our own farm but they're also a route to market for other like-minded small producers as well so we, we kind of think that 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 you know that that works yeah and was it through experience that you decided to go straight to market i mean was there a reason that you chose it because it, it's quite it, like it's it's there's a lot there to there's a lot of challenges i'm sure um what was well, the uh, kind of base or the reasoning behind yeah. it? Yeah, I, I like. I think, I think many of the people who are on um, some of the guys are on this call, for example, might be farmers who, um, have got to go to a mart or got to go to a factory, or there's only one route and that's it, and that's the bottom line. And sometimes you don't even know what you're going to get paid. You sort of, oh, this is what I get. Okay, right. And there's no choice. 
So I suppose um, I, I we, we weren't comfortable with that sort of model. And, um, you know, you know, I think the more control you have and the closer you can get to the end user or the consumer um, and the closer they, they, they'll appreciate because they know where it's coming from. They'll know what they're getting. They'll trust what they're getting. And um, and then you can get a better price for that and make your business more sustainable because the businesses that are supplying the factories are not sustainable. They, they're not they don't they don't stand up on their own two feet and without the subsidies and out the, without the payments that people are getting, then people wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Well, and, and the other side of that, the other one of the other kind of drivers for the idea of the business really was about that we knew when we came back to the farm that we wanted to be food producers um, as opposed to just farmers, that we wanted to produce food here on the farm and feed it to our own family and eat it ourselves um, and then have a surplus that we could sell um, direct to our kind of local community. I suppose getting a little bit back to the old days of Liam's um, Liam's family who would have been, you know, very much subsistence farmers growing their own food and having surplus to sell at the market. We really liked that idea, but mm -hmm. recognise that, that to actually do that in real life in modern in, in modern times is, is really, really difficult. So I suppose we kind of set ourselves that challenge. I think it's quite an interesting challenge as well, because there's a public perception sometimes, and I could be wrong, you're in the cool face of it, that organic is is priced at a certain premium. But whereas you're also kind of crossing that over with fast food so your consumers are you know maybe slightly different to what people stereotypically thought think an organic consumer is uh, am I right in saying that or am I off yeah absolutely I think one, one of the really important things for us is that we wanted and, and actually again a, re a really tough challenge for us as a business is that we wanted the food we're producing to be um, uh, accessible you know that is, this is we, we're not uh, in the business of um supplying steaks to kind of Ashford Castle and, and, and getting a huge premium on, on, on the product. Sometimes we might think, un unfortunately, <laughs> but um, but no, we wanted the food to be really accessible. We wanted the restaurants to be accessible. We wanted it to be a price point where, you know, it's not, you're, you're paying a little bit more than you would pay at the McDonald's, which is just opened across the road from the city. But not, not, a, not, a, but not a huge amount, yeah. Sorry. Like it's, it's, it's and one of the things that we want to make sure that people know is that the food that we're producing and the, the end product in the restaurants is not, that much more expensive than McDonald's and for what you're getting is actually good value so yeah. um, that's just one of the points I wanted to get across mm. yeah, no and I think it's really important but how much education do you feel you need to do with your consumers is education part of your business or have you, have you got yeah. enough other yeah uh, it's actually so the we sort of started this project 12 years ago would you believe so we came back with the kids in 2012 um, and when we first started you know, we started with a little burger trailer, actually, that we took to festivals. And then we had a kind of a prototype, very tiny cafe and farm shop in Boyle. And the conversation has changed so much over the last 12 years. Like when we first started, you would say, oh, yeah, we're organic farmers. And people would look at you and go, oh, right, OK. <laughs> you know, they just, well, what's that? All? Well, like, you know, we're all, what, what's, like, so Ireland's all organic. Um, you know, and there wasn't really, and oh, you know, paying 17 euro for a chicken, that's 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 ridiculous kind of thing. Um it's really, really changed. I think people are much, much more conscious now of what they're eating, of where their food comes from. Um, and that's really exciting to see. To, to have been part of that journey of organic food in Ireland has, has been really, really rewarding. And, and like, we have amazing conversations with people coming to the restaurant every day who have been on their own kind of food journey. And really, for whatever reason, whether it's health reasons or starting a family or just general concern for, for climate change and what's happening on, on, on the planet at the moment, that they're really questioning where their food comes from and how it's being produced. Um, so that, that that's that's really encouraging to see, I suppose. And before I move back away from the business and into the farming, and just one, you did touch on it, and I think it's quite an important thing. So if you're, you know, on the farm, you're producing your meats, your, your lettuce leaves and whatever, and then but your consumer is expecting a certain thing from you every week and matching that, like you say, you sometimes have to import to, to match it, of course. Um, mm. Is it a challenge for your farm? Because your, your business is expanding. You know, you've now got Strand Hill as well as Carrick. Have you found it a challenge to yeah. meet your demand of your consumers? Um, not not really, actually. Um, I think we probably had, we knew to some degree what we were what our, our production needed to be for the two restaurants. And so from the farm side of it, I was gearing up for that. And we had, you know, we have plenty of, yeah, well, we've got, we've got 120 hectares. And so we have the capacity to do quite a lot. But 
we also knew that we wanted to work with other local farmers. So um, so it, it seems to have worked out OK. Now, I'm not saying that's through any great planning or anything like that. We've been fortunate so that we always have we seem to have a good I have a good pipeline and you kind of have to plan in advance. So I'd have guys um, that I work with that I would buy their organic Dexter weanlings, for example, and I but they might they might be eight or nine months old when I ha get them. But I might keep them then for until they're two and a half, nearly three years of age. And um, so I, I have that pipeline coming. So so far, it's worked out fine. And we we haven't reached that kind of critical capacity level on the beef and um, the polytunnels, we seem to have manage that okay as well we we have you know we brought on extra capacity there when we opened the the new restaurants so we for we don't want to do everything so we want to do what we do and want to do it really well and we do want to work with other people so my organic dexter kind of club if you like i work with the same guys and we've we've kind of got the guys i work well with and we all trust each other and it kind of works out pretty good so um, if but it doesn't mean that, you know, when we add on new 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 things on the menu that we don't source other things from other people. And, and that actually is 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 where the challenge is. It's not so much in terms of our own production, like what we can produce ourselves in terms of the same salads and the beef. We're at the right scale for that is when we're trying to source other products from other producers that you just hit really surprising challenges. So we, we started off, like I say, our, our vegetables are always organic. So when we started, we said, okay, chips, we need to make organic chips. They need to be Irish potatoes. We've got our preparation kitchen. We set up a little chip line there. And then we went to try and buy Irish organic chipping potatoes. And actually they don't exist in Ireland all year round. <laughs> so we've had to make little compromises along the way, temporary compromises, hopefully, where there is perhaps just not the supply actually in existence in the country. Um, so there aren't enough organic store potatoes to get you through from um, kind of, the, the last season kind of March, April through to the next, um, you, you know, July sort of late potatoes. You can't use as we've tried and failed. You can't use salad potatoes for chips. So there's a good four or five months of the year where actually Irish organic potatoes just, just don't exist in the right enough quantity for us to make our, to make organic chips. So, so those kind of, so then what do we do? Um, and those kind of questions have been, have been a really, really interesting part of this project because you're constantly um work you know find alternatives working out solutions how do you not compromise on the sort of ideals you started out with but you need the business to be viable it needs to be sustainable and you know people want really good chips so you can't serve them yeah. and, and there's not many fast food joints without chips so yeah let's be yeah, honest exactly. <laughs> yeah but that's been interesting and how important i mean obviously it when people are in your store or in your shops or whatever they you know you do kind of mention that you're organic and stuff, but how important is it to your business? Do you think that you also have a lot of nature on your farm or that you're nature friendly or any of that? Or is that it's really, really important? I, I think, um, you know, a lot of the story that we try to tell in the restaurants is about where the food is coming. I think people, like I said, we have a lot of very environmentally aware customers, people who kind of seek us out because they they, they can see that we, we share that ethos. So I think it's really important. But at the same time, you know, the nice thing about the food is that it's really simple and has broad appeal, like everyone likes a burger. So um, I always tell a story about our, our um, one of the last days in our, in our little restaurant in Boyle. We had a really busy Saturday where in the morning we had a group of 30 farmers who came in for breakfast. And in the afternoon, we had a group of 25 yoga teachers. And it was really lovely that, you know, that the food has such broad appeal and the concept has such a broad appeal that actually there's the whole broad kind of spectrum of people that, that in, enjoy it, you know, whether it's families, older people people from all walks of life so that's really nice to see yeah it's kind of accessing like you say it's a, it doesn't necessarily have to be the ashford castle people it's actually yeah and, and just another point i suppose we've talked a lot about organic but um like everything we we don't have everything we're not this organic purists mm. it's just we have certain things that these are organic but in terms of the restaurant there's there are products that aren't organic and um and our bakery for example as well so a lot of the sweet things that we just can't get organic again mm -hmm. So, but we have certain certified organic breads, and um, so you know, if people come to the restaurant, they they shouldn't be afraid that oh, it's all organic and it's all really expensive, and that's that's not that's not that's not the way it works. We're trying to do as much as we possibly can organic, and if it's not organic, then we'll question the provenance or or whether it's by welfare or um, you know, and if it's affordable, and if it's affordable, that's that's the thing. Because people do need to be able to afford it as well. You know, people. Yeah. 
won't, you know, we did again another, another switch that we made early on. We started with organic chicken and then we had to switch to free range because the price of organic feed for, 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 for meat birds, it's, you know, it's, it's gone through the roof. And there's, again, there's actually not that many people. Producing, can't get the supply. There's not many people mm. doing organic meat birds in, in, in Ireland again. Um, and so we switched to free range and it just wouldn't have been affordable. We would have had to have charged like 20 euro for a chicken burger. <laughs> um, and now we can charge 12 50 for a chicken burger. So it is that yeah. balance that people yeah. can, pay, can afford to pay, you know. And when you stick your chickens in, then do you kind of... We, 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 we only have laying hens. So we just, ah, we, yeah, of course. We, just have, we don't do meat birds, yeah. Uh, excellent. So, uh, so I'll ask both of you this question, but I'll start with you, Liam. Um, if a farmer came to you and was looking for advice on where to start with considering going from field to fork, what were the main things that you would suggest from a like from the farm side of things and where to start? Oh and God! What to look um, out for? I, I would say don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Are you, are you crazy? <laughs> no, I um, I suppose I would I I wouldn't be able to help myself. I'd say where are you based? Who who is your market? Where where have you got somewhere? Where people there's enough people to buy what you're thinking of. Um, have you got a premises where you can sell this stuff from? And is that is that rent viable? And is it a good is it a good location? They they're kind of they're actually really key questions because you know most farmers are really really smart guys and they're very versatile and they're very resilient. Um, and they can produce and I you know no worries about guys being able to produce for the for the enterprise but the real kind of that i think a part of that they, they'll have no problem with that and they shouldn't be afraid of the other side but the other side is important what the location has to be right um and the concept and how that's how that's engineered and how that's executed and that definitely farmers should not be afraid of it but it just has to be thought through and it has to be the boxes have to be ticked but you know one of the things i went to courses when we first came back and from the UK and like um, butchery courses from Chagas and all this. And basically I, I was, I was like, what the hell is going on here? It was farmers being told that they can't do stuff. They were told you're a producer, you good lad yourself, you keep producing. Don't you worry about this butchery side of things. We'll sort that, you know, get a butcher. He'll do all that for you and da, 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 you know, get the professionals, but actually, you know, I was there to learn about it. I was there to to know how to do it. I was there to learn how to employ someone, and so I knew what to tell them to do. And I and I just felt that we farmers need to be more confident about what they can do because they can do a lot. And any farmers who can survive in this environment, um, with the weather and with the way the pricing is structured, and the way the market structured, you know, I I've got like huge respect for for many guys. Um, and women that can farm and survive in this in this climate. Fair enough. And and Justina, what do you, what would your kind of main things to consider, more, more on the business side of things? So people have a product, um, they potentially have a good butcher, or if it needs that or whatever, taking it to the next step. What do you think is important? I think like one of the things we I think you you, you touched on it there earlier in the conversation. We, we do uh, you know maybe start with one thing like we are doing a lot we're doing a lot of different things and we're, we're, we're kind of you know the farm to restaurant um thing because we want to do um use as much of our own produce as possible we're kind of involved in lots of different steps along the food chain but i i'm I'm often envious of people who kind of have a product which they have developed it's a honey guy yeah like like a guy who supplies us with our honey like he just does honey and he does it amazingly well and he knows everything there is to know about bees and he's an expert in honey um or um or our, our, our friend who'd roast our coffee for us in the restaurant so she is a coffee roasting guru she's amazing and she roasts our coffee for us freshly a couple of times a week and um our tessa coffee it's it, it's fabulous so i think specialism is, is probably an easier place to start so ha have a think about what you can produce on your farm um and and you know and, and it might be it might be food or it might be uh, have you got something special on your farm could it be farm visits um, could it be an experience? Um, think about a product that, that you can do and, and, and maybe start small, maybe start with that one thing. And then you never know where that's going to take you after that. Yeah, interesting. If anyone has any questions for Justina and Liam, pop them in the chat box there and um, and I can help asking uh, ask them. Um, so 
Liam, you mentioned that you you went on some Chagas courses when you came back. Where, in terms of what you guys do now, where would you look to for support and advice, or where would you make suggestions that people kind of? Well, yeah, so, yeah that, like that's a huge question, and I think it very. There's so many different. There's a lot of support out there, um, um, in terms of the leader side of things. Um, even the organic grants for any organic farmers is really strong organic grants. Now we haven't been very good at availing of that um, of the grants, but there are grants out there. Um, and I think I think it's important. One of the things from a that I think it's important that you follow what you want to do rather than following the grant as well. And if what you want to do and that fits in with the grant, then that's brilliant. But sometimes people are kind of, you know, kind of, oh, there's a grant for this, I'll do that, whatever. But mm. have, if, 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 if there's support there, then then I think it's relatively easy to find out about those things um, through the local, local the local station. enterprise office, the leader program and the organic, uh, the organic guys um, for for the organic grants. Um, so, yeah, I think the supports are there. The government supports are there, definitely. Um, so, you know, what, what I think is, is more difficult to find is if you're doing stuff, say if you're even even hens, free range hens around the farm or moving hens around the place, like there's so many, there's so much red tape involved in that. And then, you know, and there is no one kind of place to go for that. You just have to talk to different people who are doing it. And that's what I find works well is pick up the phone send someone an email, ask the question to someone who's already doing it and doing it pretty well. And normally people are very happy to help. And I'm always, I've always been happy to help anyone who's contacted us, um, you know, within reason and to spend 20 minutes on the phone and say, look, don't do that. Or, you know, they'll probably do it anyway. But, um, <laughs> you know, and so there's, there's the people who are already doing it are doing similar, something similar, finding out how, about their journey and how that, that, how that worked. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good point, I think. And like I know that Farming for Nature, we offer a mentorship program and I it's been probably our more successful program is that kind of farmers going onto other farmers' land and giving them a hand or whatever, you know. Um, sorry, Justina, what do you think in terms of good places for support? Yeah, no, exactly and advice? what we've been saying there. And I think networks like that, like Farming for Nature, um, the Organic Trust as well, you know, kind of looking up um, uh, and, and social media, actually. I was going to say your, your question around um, starting a business Social social media is such a, a huge opportunity that wasn't really there 10, 15 years ago. Um, and, you know, to, to get on social media and to tell your story and to tell the story of the product. And, and, you know, it's actually really easy now to make contact with your customer base in a way that it wasn't when when we were young. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, that... so, you know, if, you, if you're not a social media expert yourself, then if you have a, a member of the family that is um, a, 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 one of our, do our daughter is um, great on TikTok, for example, you know, um, become familiar with that as a, as a tool um i was just going to say that there's there's Liz, Liam said leader has um, a food initiative there's a whole tranche of funding there for food program uh for, for food projects um the organic farming scheme um there's, there's a kind of capital investment scheme for um on farm and off farm organic processing if you're if you're in organic farming and then Fulcher, Fulcher island at the moment ha have um that's a good one yeah there's a there's a big tranche of funding there which has just opened up they're lo actively looking i think the deadline is june for people um who have ecotourism type projects they're really really excited about on-farm accommodation um sustainable accommodation you know the kind of lodges and cabins that idea so there's a lot of funding available right are you now. moving into this area <laughs> too <laughs> <There you go. laughs> so, maybe to be considered yeah. Um, so I, I've rarely been on a QA. and a in fact I don't think I've ever had a Q&A where there's no questions because I think you're covering everything so uh, <laughs> so we haven't had any questions yet so if anyone has any questions please pop them in so just the last few questions for me um, what have been your main challenges along the way what have you been your big learning kind of what are your big lessons that you've learned oh, on the farm say and then we can go on to the business more side of it um, um, I, I think I think the, the big learning the big learning on the farm for me, um, I suppose, has been um, do do what you can do well, um, so and do it do it really well, and if you can do it to a bit of scale, and have the right equipment or the right housing, um, so when we very started off first, we would have had we we experimented with free range pigs. And um, I really, really enjoyed having the pigs and uh, yeah, they were fantastic. Um, but 
just the management of the pigs and to do pigs well, you need to do them in numbers. Um, so if you, you know, when you need, you know, a good number of sows and if you have a good number of sows, then you're into, um, you're into that, that management of those sows and, and they have to be, they have to be done really well and you can't afford to not have sows in, in pig, et cetera, et cetera. So do the things you can do really well and have the right equipment and the right housing and try and do it to a little bit of a scale. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, Justina, what were the main challenges that you've come across? <clears throat> um, I think similarly to what Liam's talking about there is, is that, you know, we started off very, very ambitious. We had idea, we had a kind of an idea that we wanted to sort of do everything and try everything. And I think maybe just kind of tempering, you know, not biting off more than you can chew, really. <laughs> you know, keeping it really focused, starting small and kind How's of... How's that working out for you? <laughs> gradually, yes. <laughs> it's great. It's really, it's really uh, amazing. So we've had a few questions coming in here. Mary Cannon's asked, very interesting talk, amazing achievement to have so many enterprises. Can I ask how many people you employ and how do you manage that? So Christina, maybe you? About 65 at the moment across all the different businesses. Yeah. Okay. So and how do you manage that? Um, it's kind of fun and challenging. <laughs> so people, you know, people is, is, is the kind of best bit about what we're doing, but it's also the hardest bit, you know, because that's 65 people who, um, uh, you, you know, that, you, that, that need support they need to know that if they're doing what needs to be done um they need to be making a contribution so kind of channel you know kind of managing all of that can, can be challenged it's the 65 people have other stuff going on as well it's not the job so um it is it's it, it's full on i mean i think i think that like, we really enjoy it so we both of the restaurants would have, we have a kind of a senior management team that um are really strong um and we're really lucky to have to have them on board um so that you know to have that get and it's taken us a while to get that structure right um so uh yeah it's um it's yeah, and communications then so we have this it's we're kind of multi-site so we use technology quite a lot as well so we have a kind of a microsoft teams for the business where we can kind of we'll, we'll talk to each other um and um it, we use various apps so we use something called presumably to kind of manage payroll and manage time cards and all that kind of stuff so there's a bit of technology underpinning it all as well um to, to kind of just manage that number of people and that many conversations that go on in, the, on in the business every day yeah no it's really important actually that make sure that the bulls aren't juggling too much and that you can get help like that here i'm along has asked uh, thanks for the talk so much so far what would you say is your main source of income and would the farm be self-sufficient without the restaurant income what is that <laughs> <laughs> so um income uh would the farm be self-sufficient i suppose between the 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 payments that the department um that we get uh, i suppose the farm would be making a little bit of money um and i think i think i don't think it would be the farm would be that much different um except we wouldn't have the income from from possibly as much on the market garden side but i think the farm would be the same we would sell our our beef through through you know some to some other the brave herders or through um ABP Nina or something like that um and get an okay price for it so um we we have an income from the bakery is 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 provides an income as well so I'm not sure if that question sort of yeah if the restaurants weren't there we'd have the farm and the farm would it wouldn't it wouldn't we wouldn't be um it wouldn't be a huge income but it would be positive I think and the bakery would be positive as well and what breed of what are, are the organic pigs well, we, we don't do the pigs anymore, but um, they were kind of, they were mixed breeds, mixed kind of breeds with um, kind of, with with some commercial strain in them, like Duroc, mostly Duroc or... But um, when, but, when we started out, we had a really, two really lovely breeding styles. We had a Tamworth called Dolly and a Berkshire called Rosie. And that, that, that's where we started. <laughs> and the first, the first, so that was when we, we just, we didn't even have a shop or anything. We were just kind of finding our way around the farm and getting to... You know, kind of learning the ropes, I suppose. But the first um, um, piglets that we had on the farm that was a really that was a really exciting day. Yeah, they were they were the pigs were fantastic. Were but it's too. very hard to do, to manage them on heavy clay soils. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was going to ask: is why did you move out of them? That it's kind of more what yeah. your farm uh, could offer. We kind of experimented with them, and if we were going to do them, we would have. I knew we would have to do them on a bigger scale, um, but. It just wasn't. It wasn't kind of wasn't viable. Wasn't viable. Thing, was I think they work well in a kind of in an arable rotation, and mm -hmm. we wouldn't have had the land at that time to do it. 
and even now I probably would we wouldn't do it in 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 the on the other farm because because I know you'd have to do it to scale and we wouldn't be able to do, afford to do that with the price of organic feed um and with yeah they wouldn't it yeah, wouldn't have worked Fair enough. Uh, Heather Jem uh, directly messaged me, but I think she meant message everyone. Looking back, if you wanted to change anything you had done, what would you do differently? Wow, that's mm. a really good question. Probably not try and concertina as much as we did in a, such a short time because we um, it was it was the whole COVID thing. We had planned to open one restaurant and then another, you know, but the way it worked out, we were delayed in one restaurant mm -hmm. and then we had to fast forward the other restaurant because it had the drive through. So we ended up doing way too much within sort of Very within close, within two, so like three years. We've got like two fully kitted out restaurants, the design of them, the design of the brand. The, we've got the restaurants open. We've got to hire, hire 65 people and we've got our bakery up and running. We've got our production kitchen up and running. We've got the farm kind of systems up and running. All the, all the tech and all just the systems for the restaurants and the finance side of it, like all that within two, two and a half years, years yeah. um, mm. was totally ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. You've done, you seem to have managed to pull it off. Um, Liz McCauley has asked a few questions. So I'll just I'll start with the first one. So this is super interesting and impressive. Thank you. Did you start out with certified organic for the market garden specifically, or did you decide that, that it would be beneficial to go to organic afterwards? Um, so no, we kind of came with the idea that we wanted to be an organic farm. So that that was part of the when we moved back to the farm, we sort of knew that that was the road we were. We, She's talking about the market garden. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so but organic farm in general. So we were already organic when we actually started the market garden. So um, it was always okay. going to be um, yeah, uh, organic. Yeah. And then is supplying the two restaurants enough in terms of the market for the market garden, or do you rely also on the farm shop shops? Actually, um, most of what we're producing in the market garden, um, so, so we're, we're really only growing salads, herbs all year round. And then in the summer, we do a selection of um, vegetables, tomatoes and cucumbers and courgettes and beans, that kind of thing, just to have it in the rotation. All of that veg, actually, we only really sell in the shops. Um, and then the salad we sell in the shops. We do salad bags in the shops. We do kale. We do spinach in the shops. And then we also, the, the salad goes into the kitchen as well for, for the burgers and as the base for our kind of bowls of salad. So, um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the restaurants is enough. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's between the shops and the rest. The shops are in the same building as the restaurant. They're all on the same site. So everything that goes from the market garden goes either to the shop. Yeah. Some, I, sometimes we get lots of things and, you know, the, the, the hens are very happy to munch through most of it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> fair yeah. enough. Um, and also her final question, how I'd like to know how you've found the acre scheme so far. Um, I, I think it's great when someone gives you money. Um, <laughs> so uh, we get it. We got a check there for you know for for both the acre schemes for both Justina's farm and my farm. So for us, it was it was kind of a no brainer because we have ticked the rare breed um livestock box, and we both have a riparian kind of zone that was suitable for for that. So for very 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 little work. That we were able to, I had to move the some cows over to Justina's farm at the start, but for for not too much work, we were able to take a lot of boxes for the acre scheme. So, um, so yeah, so I'm not going to argue with it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, Paul Ford has asked, do you see any land deficiencies that there is, where I suppose where there is minimal artificial fertilizer? Um, yeah. Look, if 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 you're not doing something, then farming organically will take its toll. Um, you know, we we have a lower stocking rate. I think on the on Justina's farm, we go between one. I think it's one point seven, um, to two livestock units per hectare. And on our heart farm here, which is a bit heavier and lots of woodland and all that, so it's probably less. You know, a good bit less than that. So less than one point five. So um, we we have our composted farmyard manure. And um, so that that's the kind of the biggest thing that we have, and we lime fairly regularly. Put out limes, and um, I have my own kind of little grazing kind of craziness that I do. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's a sort of a bit of regen, and um, it kind of works okay. So 
Um, I kind of leave the cattle in. Um, I, I don't put them in until the grass is quite high. And then I, I take them out pretty quickly. And there's always trampled, you know, so it seems to work and it seems to regenerate itself. So we're not terrible on, on soil sampling, but, you know, we're always moving the hens around has been absolutely brilliant. So anywhere where the hens have been, it's just been fantastic. So they're in, just to explain, they're in a mobile tunnel um, and um, that can be on skids so you can kind of move it around. Now, there are there are restrictions. So, mm -hmm. I mean, where you can move it because of this whole government um, department of the poultry people come on and inspect us and all that. So we're, mm -hmm. we're not supposed to do a lot of things with them. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I think you've kind of answered this, but are you understocked in animals for the amount of land so you can maintain organic or do you grow enough winter feed? Um, or can you grow enough winter feed? Yeah, so I think we're okay for the winter feed. Um, so for what we have, so we still have maybe five, four or five tons of oats left um, from what we grew and they will kind of do the hens and you know we're probably feeding some of the bullocks that we're going to kill, and um, they'll get a touch of oats as well of the of the oats over the next kind of few weeks, and then and then that and then that that that's kind of yeah. So we we're okay on the feed, thank God. And Emma Jem has asked, what's your most, what are you most excited about for the future of organic farming? Oof. Um, I think like we believe it's is the way forward i mean it is it is a growth area in ireland it's still a really tiny percentage of the number of of of, of farmland in the country but it's growing all the time i think they had the highest ever um intake of organic far of farmers into the organic farming scheme this year which is really exciting to see so um and yeah i think i think there's just like i was saying before i think there's actually just more and more the consumer demand for it is growing i think um mm -hmm. and, uh, so as long as it's affordable you know yeah, that's the thing yeah. so you know where, where you have something that's organic and you know, say organic flour we import um you know 14 tons of organic flour every few months and it's 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 not expensive but i know that that flour hasn't been touched by at by about you know is there 15 sprays that you know that the wheats and the barleys and that wheat gets you know, on a conventional farm how many sprays does it get you got the seed dressing you've got all the pest control you've got uh, you've got all the different sprays for all the rusts and everything else and mm. like do you, you know i mean do i trust people to say that that's okay i i, I don't mm. yeah no it's 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 detrimental in many ways um a few people have said Goromi Mahagut and all that kind of stuff. And and thanks and impressive. And um, Mary Cannon has said she missed the name of your restaurants and they're called Honestly in Carragon Shannon and in Strand Hill, isn't it? That's where yeah. people can visit you. Kitchen.ie is the is the website. Oh yeah. And the so people can find um you on social media on the honestly uh uh sorry, honestly kitchen social media or the farm is found through Drumalera Farm. Um I had just one, one or two last questions. You, you mentioned earlier um, that the young, fa you have a family, and presumably you're creating a legacy for them. How does that make you feel about how you farm your land? That you know that there's, there's another generation looking in at you and potentially, you know, coming after you on the land, especially if you've had ancestors on your land for only four hundred years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no pressure. If, if, if they only saw, if they only saw what I was doing now, they were like, "What the hell is he at?" <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, look, I, I think it's about trying to look. People will make their own decisions, and you know, if our kids get involved and and take that side of it, oh, you kind of can't mitigate for what they will do or not do, but. You you can do the you can make the best decisions that you can make, bearing in mind what you think is coming down the tracks, weather wise and environment, you know, environmentally wise. So that's why we're kind of looking into the agroforestry now, and that's a kind of a long term play in terms of that could be, uh, you know, how long how long is that? It's a long time, and um, it you know in 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 the history of the world, it's just a crop, but from our point of view, it's a it's a it's a lifetime. So, so yeah, we're looking into making some of those decisions and we hope that they would kind of make life easier for the next generation that are going to farm that land or make it more, make it, it make it sense for them. So um, it's something that we're, you obviously think about, you know, but you, you kind of have to make the decisions based on, on what you think yourself like.
And and it's really why how where we, how we started with all of this. You know, where, where really the idea for this came about when we were starting to plan for a family and um, became you know more interested in, in health and nutrition and fertility and all of those things. And then when the kids came along, what we were actually feeding them and also what kind of planet they're going to grow up into. You know, that 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 this this it's such a worrying time really. Um, uh, you know, in terms of what, what's happening in terms of climate change. Um, and the environmental impact of of the way we're living on the planet. So I suppose, um, yeah, like producing food that we wanted to eat ourselves, that we wanted to feed our kids, and also looking to see is is it possible to do things a different way? I suppose. No, it's been really interesting, and I didn't mean to offend anyone with my Irish. I'm just not very good with um, actually saying Irish, but uh, there's a <laughs> comment there, so sorry about that. Um, but like everyone said, thanks so much. You've been re- taking your time to educate and inform us. It's been really impressive. I think when you say you're employing 65 people, but you're, the fact you're actually only employing two on your farm for all of it, that's very impressive as well. <laughs> like, there's a... Uh, there's a lot to be said for both of you on uh, what you've managed to achieve both <laughs> inside the farm gates and outside. So thanks so much for sharing us. I know that we um, possibly have a farm walk planned with you in August, I think. So all our farm yeah. our farm walks are st- uh, starting to go up online. We have about 20 planned over the next few months, uh, but sorry, between May and October. So if anyone would like to go on any of our farm walks, including on Justina and Liam's farm, please sign up. There's only 25 places and I know that they'll book out fast. Thank you so much for everything that you shared with us this evening. It's been really, really interesting and really inspiring. And I look forward to uh, visiting your farm one day and also tasting your delicious food again. <laughs> I've been very lucky to have tasted it so far. So if anyone's passing through Carrick on Shannon or on Strand Hill in, Sl- <clears throat> in County Sligo, do drop into their farm uh, restaurants. I'm sure they'd uh, love to have you there. So our next Q&A will be the second Tuesday of next month. It's to be confirmed who the the speaker is, but it will be one of our um, ambassadors. Like I say, our farm walk schedule is now up online, so feel free to join us. Um, This event was supported by the National Parks and Department of Agriculture. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Most of all, Justine and Liam, superb. Thank you. Really interesting. So thank you so much for that. And we look forward to um, meeting you in person. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Love talking to you.